So our next speaker is Connor O'Kane with Mars Flight VR, a VR helicopter simulator set in a real location on Mars. Welcome, Connor. Thanks for coming, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to cover what is Mars Flight VR for the, for the few of you that might not have played how, how it was made, why I'm making it, what's the purpose of it, and what my future plans I think this presentation will be about three years ago. So I'm Connor O'Kane from Ireland, and I live in Australia. I've been working in the games industry for about 20 years. I started on the PlayStation. I started as an artist and an animator primarily, and then I moved into design programming and programming later. I'm now the director of IO Normal, which is a game development studio in Melbourne. Uh, we make games, simulations, uh, virtual reality, and augmented reality apps, and all those apps and mobile apps. And we do contracting and 3D printing as well. And I teach video game development uh, at RMIT University, it's the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. <coughs> there's two video game courses there. There's a degree in computer science, which teaches games graphics programming, and there's a game design degree as well, which is an art, and I teach classes in both of those. The Mars Flight VR is really a hobby project that I do in my spare time. So what is Mars Flight VR? I'm going to show you some videos so to give you an idea of what the game is about. Um, it's a helicopter simulator <coughs> set on Mars, but, but not just set on Mars, it's set in Jezero Crater, the landing site for the 2020 rover. <coughs> and there's, uh, there's many ways to play it. You can just explore Mars at your leisure if you want to, um, but there are also missions you can play. So, for example, this is coming up on a photography mission. So I want to teach people what the rovers are, what, what the uh, drone is actually going to do. So in this mission, you're tasked with photographing three nearby locations in the quickest time possible. You have to fly over and then read the instructions. So the real helicopter is, if it works, is going to fly ahead of the rover and take pictures and send those back to the planning crew so they can decide where they will photograph and when they will explore. <coughs> Excuse me. It says photograph this location at 15 meters altitude facing northeast. So this is a typical activity that the real helicopter will have to do. In VR, you're given a, a camera view in the bottom right there, and you have to align the camera with the target. So the real helicopter has a downward pointing camera. I'm not sure of the field of view, so I've done a fairly narrow field of view. And you press the A button on your controller to take a photograph and then fly over to the next location. So I, I basically made a game out of what the helicopter is going to do. Of course, the real helicopter is autonomous. It flies itself, and the folks that uh, JPL will just give it a target location and off it'll go and take its pictures. And it probably won't fly as recklessly as I'm flying here. So I'm flying this manually with two joysticks, like a radio control helicopter. The game has a more stable mode for people that aren't gamers or radio control helicopter enthusiasts. And it'll stabilize and hover it on, on its own. But uh, people like me that like actually flying the helicopter, you can use the two joysticks on the Xbox controller to fly the game. Many people like to fly quadcopters on Earth in um, what's called FPV mode. FPV is first person video, where you see the video stream from the helicopter in a pair of goggles that you wear on your, on your head, and it looks like this. You get the first person view from the drone, and when it rotates, the camera rotates. It's very disorienting for people that aren't used to flying, but if you fit it and you enjoy flying, it's a great way to play it. So the game also has races and it has uh, this FPV mode for the helicopter fans. There'll be steam leaderboards so you can compete online and post that high score. So that's, that's what the game is. So the key features are that it's uh, not just a game on Mars, it's really in Jezero Crater. I'm using the digital terrain model. The DTM is a digital terrain model from the high-rise camera, which is a camera aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, I'll show you briefly how that works. Okay, so this is the, this is the crater. There was a river here. It left the River Delta as it flowed into the lake. The rover's going to land here. And how does it work? So high-rise flies in a roughly polar orbit, north to south, photographing a really long, thin strip of landscape. Um, 
But sometimes they have the opportunity to take another photograph of the same landscape from a different angle. So they'll photograph it facing forward and then they'll photograph it facing back. So they get a stereo pair. Um, with that pair of images, they can do a parallax difference and, and detect the height difference. <coughs> so there's an example. And then this is the digital terrain model that shows the height. And you can see they're extremely accurate. There's actual ripples in the sand in this area. I believe it's 30 centimeters per pixel. So that's really mm -hmm. that's really good. And all that from parallax, not from not from the laser altimeter. I, I'm not sure if they use both or if they combine them. Um, but in in each case where I've downloaded it, it's only available when I have a stereo pair. Huh. So I suspect it's it's only available when they use parallax. Um, <coughs> Highrise is run by the team at the University of Arizona, and uh, they've very kindly written a Blender importer, so that you don't have to use complex uh, geographic information system software. You can just bring the terrain model into Blender, which is a free, open source uh, 3D software, and very easily import the model into uh, a render or into a game. You may have seen people have done um, video flyovers of many locations on Mars. Those are using the DTA models as well. So there's the landing site. This box here is the area covered by the game. So it's um, five by seven kilometers in total. It's about eight gigabytes of terrain data, which are low energy. Which means it won't fit on an Oculus Quest, so I'm gonna have to figure out how to compress it down to get it on an Oculus. So at the moment it runs on PC, VR systems like the Vive, um, but I wanna get it on others. Okay, the next key feature is that it's a real helicopter, and as much as possible, I've tried to recreate the handling of the real helicopter. Um, it's, it's using Mars gravity and extremely low uh, atmospheric density, very low drag. But I'm guessing the handling parameters. I don't know the actual handling parameters, so I'm just guessing. The, the picture on the left is the helicopter getting ready for stowage. Um, that's the one in the game. These are these are little tracking balls for uh, tracking the shape of the helicopter. Uh, yep, simulating correct gravity and atmospheric density. It'll be uh, on all PC VR headsets primarily. That's the Valve Index, the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift. Uh, this, this is a Windows MR headset, so there's many manufacturers of these, but anything that connects to a PC will run it. <coughs> okay, so the next phase I'm going to go over is how was the game made? And the short answer is it's made in the Unity game engine. So pretty much everybody making VR games is either using the Unreal Engine or the Unity Engine. It really comes down to personal preference. If you like programming in C Sharp, you use Unity. If you like programming in C++, you use Unreal. Other than that, they really both do the same thing. They're both free to start out with, and then they charge you money over a certain threshold once you make a certain amount of money. They're very good for prototyping because if you're not making any money, they're completely free. But I've chosen Unity um, partly because I teach Unity at college, and so it's good for me to keep up to date with it. Now, the game didn't come out of nowhere. I didn't just suddenly make a helicopter simulator. I've been working in games for a long time, and my previous game was Ice Caves of Europe. So I'm going to show you a little bit of Ice Caves so you can see where Mars Flight came from. So Ice Caves um, has 3D graphics, but it's actually two-dimensional gameplay. Um, the flight model is like a helicopter. You, you apply thrust and it, it, is, it uses inertia, um, but it's locked in, in a plane. You're flying in a plane, so it's a lot easier. So this is a science fiction story about a, a comet smashing through the surface of Europa and exposing the lakes underneath, which evaporate and become caves. And so a, a flying rover is sent in to explore these caves. And wouldn't you know, it finds alien life, of course. So it, it's kind of a bit of a storyline and a science fiction story. But while I was making this game, I want you to notice that I was exploring uh, inertia-based flight and also the idea of an augmented reality heads-up display. In other words, a heads-up display which is projected around the vehicle and shows the flight characteristics uh, sort of a sort of in VR before I did VR. So this game is not in VR at the moment, although I might port it to VR later. So that, this took me about three years to make, and it was released in 2018. And towards the end of the development, I realized I've really basically written a 2D helicopter simulator here. Why don't I, why don't I try and make a full helicopter simulator? And, and at the same time, I was getting interested in VR. So I, I made this prototype of a game which is a, a large-scale helicopter with a tail rotor um, and using Earth physics. So this is Earth gravity and atmospheric density. Uh, something like an attack helicopter, a really big helicopter. And I'm flying it with um, a flight stick and throttle. And this is a Dell uh, MR headset. 
And I use this prototype really to develop most of the code for the heads-up display. So the heads-up display is projected on a sphere around the pilot. And the text is quite far away. It's about 10 meters away, which means your eyes are very relaxed. You're focusing in the distance when you see it. It's easy to read. I was frustrated with the other VR flight sims I played because they have tiny little cockpits with tiny text, which is very hard to read. In VR, it's difficult to read small-scale text. So I wanted to make a heads-up display, which is easy to read. I wanted a, a responsive game that's quick to load. You didn't have to learn how to fly the helicopter to just get into the flight. Now you can see already I was thinking about Mars because the sky here is, is, is beige. This is randomly generated scenery just using noise, procedural textures, and um, it wasn't actually set on Mars yet. It wasn't using realistic terrain. It was just a, a random terrain. So at the same time while I'm making this helicopter, I'm also very interested in 3D prints. You can see I brought a few of the prints up to the front here. So for, for, for many years, I've been downloading terrains and using the, um, the Space Shuttle Radar Tomography Mission scanned almost all of the Earth at quite high resolution. So I've been downloading those and 3D printing. And this is, actually, you'll probably all recognize this one. This one will be a bit harder because this is Earth. <laughs> so that's Valles Marinaris. This is um, Crater Lake in Oregon. And this is using the Space Shuttle's uh, span of the Earth. Um, so I've been printing these for a long time, and, and eventually I found the high-rise DTM models and started printing those. And so I got very familiar with um, importing the high-rise data, cropping it into a, a nice area, scaling it correctly, and then printing it. And I, I paint them afterwards. Then. Um, JPL announced the landing site for the 2020 rover, and they said it's going to go here in Jezero Crater. And I thought, ah, oh, there's, a, there's a really good digital terrain model that I should put that in my game. And actually, instead of just being some hypothetical place on Mars, why don't I put the real landing site in so people can fly there before the rover even gets there and explore it and have a look? And so I thought, this is the perfect combination. I know how to work with the high-rise data. I've got a helicopter simulator. Let's stick them together and make a, make a VR game. Now, it's not that simple. It's not that simple because the high-rise scans aren't in real color. So the height data is very accurate, but the color data is not. In fact, the, this is how the high-rise camera works. They have a wide-angle camera that takes a, a monochrome image, and then they have a narrow band of color down the middle. I think it's five kilometers for the wide band and about 500 meters or a bit more for the middle. I'm not sure. But the, the color strip is in infrared, red, and blue. And we're used to seeing images in RGB. What the, what the high-rise team typically do is just shove those channels into RGB and then stretch the contrast to the full version. And, and you get an image that looks like these prints here, which have too much blue in them, too much contrast in them. But they're very useful because they're very useful to see the different topography. The, the blues are actually gray shales and clay on Mars, and the reds are oxidized and, and finer dust. So they're, they're useful from an interpretive point of view, but they're not realistic, and I want to make my game realistic. So I needed a new way to texture the terrain. However, I don't want to have to hand paint 35 square kilometers of terrain to get it accurate. It's a very large scene. In, in typical video games, something like World of Warcraft, an artist will actually paint the paths and paint the grass and paint all the different areas by hand, but I didn't want to have to do that for the scene. So I'm using procedural mapping techniques. And that basically means I get the computer to do the work for me and I just tweak the numbers so it looks good. So literally what that means is I bought the MapMagic plugin for Unity. MapMagic is a plugin that does procedural terrain generation, but it also does um, scattering of rocks, simulation on the rocks, erosion, and, and very quick color uh, layering. I'll explain a little bit of what's happening here. I've got these five different layers of textures. And these are based on photographs that I've taken around Australia. So I photograph rocks that don't have any lichen on them, that don't have any vegetation on them, so I get clean, pristine rocks, and then generate tiling seamless textures that can stretch as far as I need. And then I use map magic to position them. So this is bedrock, this is the dark sand, this is cliffs, uh, this is the fine powdery dust, and this is the peaks and the exposed cracks. So if I, if I show you on the image over here, this is this gray sand is this area here. What it's saying is, if the steepness of the slope is a uh, is within a certain range. This one here is if it's between 20 and 90 degrees, you follow this pipe here, you get cliffs. And so you can see here on the cliffs, it just automatically paints it. For and if I change the numbers, these, these regions expand or contract. So really it's, uh, it's doing the coloring for me. This one here is using a concavity check. So it's looking for convex regions on the, on the peaks and it highlights them with this color here. Um, you can see here that these ripples have 
picked up the actual slope in the high-rise data and colored them appropriately. So the, the scan is really, really, really good. So that's math magic where Unity is doing a lot of the work for me. <coughs> Next, I don't want to have to place every individual rock. That's going to take a long time, too. Um, so once again, I'm using procedural rock scattering techniques. And the way that works is um, I basically tell it, OK, I want a certain number of big rocks. And whenever there's a big rock, I need about 5 or 10 small ones and about 20 or 30 really small ones. They'll tend to club together. They shouldn't stick on the sides of slope because they should roll down the slopes. So after it places the rocks, it does a physics simulation to roll them down the slopes and make them more realistic. It takes about 20 seconds for it to solve all of the rocks in this scene, and they roll down and they gather in nice little pools, and then hopefully they're all in good positions. Uh, the next thing I do is I want these big ones to look like outcrops on the edges of the cliffs. So it, you'll notice they specifically kind of appear on the light terrain. So they're supposed to look like those typical buttes that um, Curiosity is photographed, where the, the shales are overhanging the edge of the cliff. And then the smaller rocks are scattered on the flat, sandy areas. Uh, the rocks only appear when you're within a certain range. So in order to keep the frame rate high, it doesn't draw all the rocks at the same time. The ones in the distance are visible, and as you get closer, it draws a simple version of the rock, and then a slightly more detailed one, and then a more detailed one. And that way, the frame rate stays consistent no matter how far you are. <coughs> Unity has an asset store which lets you buy assets and sell assets for other developers. Um, really, without the asset store, the game, this game would take years. It, so far, I've been working on this for one year. Without the asset store, it would have taken many, many more years. Um, Map Magic, for example, cost $80 on the asset store, but it has saved me at least six months of programming. If I was to try and write the stuff that it's providing, it would take me about six months. Uh, I'm using Shader Forge for special effects and uh, custom shaders. And I'm using Microsplat for uh, the effects on the terrain. Microsplat, uh, you can't see it in this picture, but Microsplat is doing uh, wind. So when you look down, you can see the dust blowing over the landscape. And it's doing a very nice specular highlight where the sand grains are visible and they speckle in the sun. When you look towards the sun, it looks like this. These, um, these assets typically cost less than $100 and save you months of work. It's absolutely amazing. Because the Unity uh, development community is big enough, uh, developers can make an asset and sell it for a fairly small amount, but hundreds of thousands of people will buy it, particularly if you're selling art assets that people will use in prototyping. So these are just some of the common ones. I'm probably using about four or five more assets in this game. Um, I must thank Film Victoria, by the way. Film Victoria is the local government body in Australia who's funded my trip here to show you this <laughs> presentation. Uh, they fund not only television and film production, but also video game development in Victoria so that people will recognize Victoria as a hub of game development, so thank you. Okay, next I want to talk about why am I making this game. And the first reason is because I wanted to play it and nobody else was making it. Um, I, I, I think I may be too old to go to Mars, but I want to fly around on it, and VR is probably the safest and best way to do it, so I wrote this game for me to play. Um, nobody else was making this kind of game, and I thought, oh, well, the next reason, though, is science outreach and public engagement. VR has the capacity to induce a sense of scale. In other words, you, you can correctly see how big and how far things are in VR, which you can't tell on a screen. It can induce a sense of awe and of being in a real place to a much greater degree than photography. You might have seen some kids playing the game earlier. Um, when kids put on a VR headset, they completely lose their sense of self. They're unaware of their own body, and they, they transport to that location, which as a parent is terrifying. <laughs> they fall and hit their head on the sharpest thing in the room as soon as they put that headset on. But what my point is that they think they're on Mars. They think they're there. They have forgotten about their physical body, and they're on Mars. And that means if you get them to play this kind of thing at a young age, they now think of Mars as a real place. It has real mountains. It has air. And it has shadows and dust and wind, and I could go there. It's not just an imaginary place. I think VR can do this to a much greater degree than photography. But a good photograph can invoke a real sense of awe and wonder, and it doesn't even have a third dimension. Right? So, admittedly, VR isn't high resolution yet. These fo this photograph is a lot higher resolution than the VR headset I'm using outside. But I feel even in its primitive state, VR is very good at evoking a sense of uh, place and scale photographs can't do. And even IMAX or movies can't do as well as VR. <coughs> Next I'm just going to cover what are my plans for the future of the game. So 
while this is still at a prototype stage, I actually want to release it fairly soon to get feedback from um, scientists, Mars enthusiasts, and flight safety fans. So I'm going to put it out on early access in Steam. Steam is a digital content delivery system that specializes in video games, and it's got a very large VR community. So I'm going to release it uh, for half price on Steam. Uh, for about a year, people will be able to buy it before it's finished and play it in its current state. And then I'll gradually add more features during the development, based on the feedback from the players. So uh, some of the features I'd like to add are new locations. So essentially anywhere a rover has gone, I'd like to put that in the game, because those are really interesting sites. And that's Gale Crater over there. And that's a, that's a print. Um, the one on the left is the uh, inverted riverbed in Mount Sharp, where Curiosity is going to drive them. Endeavour and Victoria craters would be very interesting, I think. Gusev is a really interesting crater. And Noctis Labyrinthus would be a fantastic place to fly because it has narrow valleys with very steep canyon walls. It would be a fascinating place to fly. And there are great uh, high-rise DTMs along this location. Uh, I want to put in new vehicles, and an obvious and extremely difficult one to fly would be the Sky Crane. So I think it would be great fun to actually <coughs> deliver the rover manually flying the Sky Crane and lower it down. That would be really hard to fly, but fun. And if this helicopter mission goes well, I know that JPL plan on sending bigger and better helicopters with more cameras and more instruments. So it would be quite fun to put some of those in as well. Um, the game is quite big at the moment, so I'm targeting high-end PCs with uh, good graphics cards uh, as the initial version. But I'd like to expand to the lower-end uh, VR platforms, such as PlayStation VR and Oculus Quest. This will require optimizing a lot. I'll probably have to make the level half the size that it currently is in order to fit it and lower the textures and things like that. But I think it's viable. The frame rate is very good. I think. The frame rate's not going to be a problem, but RAM is going to be a problem. So I'm just going to need to reduce the scale of the levels. And lastly, and, and uh, I think this is likely to be uh, probably the most impactful uh, avenue for the game to reach the public and to reach kids, is to make a museum version. Uh, I'd really like to. Uh, install this in science galleries and museums so that the public can play it for free. And I'd, I would envision building a robust control system with a big joystick and a big throttle. Have a TV screen in front of the player where everybody can see their view and see what they're playing. And then have even larger 3D prints of the landing sites so that people can interact with them and uh, see where you're flying and have information about Mars. Um, part of the reason for me coming here is to meet people uh, at NASA and to meet people interested in uh, outreach and PR. Um, if, you, if you know anyone involved in science galleries or museums who would be interested in a, a Mars VR installation, please send them to me. Um, the game is available for free to everyone at the conference. If you just come over to my table and put your email address uh, onto my iPad, I'll send you a Steam key and you can download it. It'll be ready in a few months, I think, and you'll be able to download it. Um, that's it. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for working on this. It's super exciting. You know, I, as you know, I work on the VR app for the Mars Society, and it's just really cool to see this project. Um, super great work. One question I had um, is, can you talk a little bit more about how you convert the high-rise digital terrain modules into something in, that you can use in Unity? Yeah, actually, actually, it's a very roundabout problem. process, because high-rise is delivering what's called a height map, which is just a list of numbers of heights. The Blender importer makes that into a 3D mesh. But you don't want to put a 3D mesh into Unity. You need to use Unity's terrain system, which is actually based on a height map. So I render a black and white height map from Blender, and I bring that into Unity. Um, height maps can render much faster than a 3D mesh, because uh, a height map discards the uh, X and Z information. It just keeps the Y the height. And it discards the UV coordinates, and it discards many things. Height maps can't be rotated or scaled. And by removing all these features, they can render much faster. And also, height maps tessellate in the distance, so that as the uh, camera looks further, you're seeing lower and lower resolution, which keeps it back. So my advice is, don't use the actual 3D model. Render a height map. And I'm happy to email you the instructions on how to do that. Because then you can import the image into Unity as a raw image, and make a height map. And it, re it renders extremely quickly. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Is your flight model of the uh, of the helicopter based on performance curves, or do you do full blade element theory? It's entirely simulating the symptoms of height, uh, the symptoms of flight. It's not an accurate simulation. So I use Unity's rigid body simulation. It does the inertia and the gravity and the collision. 
and then one by one I layer on the feel of a helicopter. So I layer on drag, I layer on uh, ground effects, uh, decreasing um, lift as you increase in altitude. Each of these effects are layered on one by one, and as long as it feel good, feels good, I keep it. It's not an accurate physical simulation at all. So it's a performance curve, basically. Yes, exactly. Cool. It's safe. Cool. Yes, it's, does this feel right? And if so, I keep it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sorry, I'm a, <clears throat> from a graphic designer point of view. Yeah. Um, I guess let me give you a little history. I, uh, I used to work for a company that wanted to see what a house would look like from painting. Okay. So a lot of these the, like numbers that you have are basically <clears throat> the things I was looking for when yeah. I was younger. Um, my question though goes to, could you use the, the mapping technique to show the possibility of terraforming or the concept oh, yeah, of changing yeah. a, a yeah. gray to a green or a Yeah, let me go back to this uh, map magic. Uh, another one of the features that map magic has is inbuilt erosion. So you can run hydraulic or wind erosion over terrain okay. over a simulated number of years to create peaks, to create valleys. Um, the, the, the tool is much more sophisticated than I have to use on Mars. It does beaches, forests, uh, okay. everything you need for a realistic role playing. <coughs> I'm only using two features from it procedural terrain and color. So, yeah, I would use something like this to do an erosion pass, for example, on the terrain to see what it would look like in the future. It can even do things like uh, if you're eroding the peaks, I want the sediment to stay at the bottom of the cliffs rather than blowing away right. so that you get uh, scree slopes and then jagged. Looks like a Matterhorn, that kind of thing. You can choose to have uh, glaciation or, or rain erosion. Yeah, you can, you can you can absolutely take a terrain and fast forward as far as you like. Nice. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yep. As the helicopter um, it is actually gathering data and images, um, if, if it does, uh, yeah. are, you, are you going to take that information and potentially um, put yeah, this on the Yeah, I mean, yeah I, use this as a tool for visualizing <laughs> the actual data that gets collected. Yes, and cool. it would be entirely possible to take its color and image and like, remap it onto my height map. Yeah, that would be absolutely right. But also, I've guessed at the rock placement. I'm randomizing the rock placement. If I get accurate rock placement, the reason why I couldn't put that data right back in. Um, I, I know many sports are doing this kind of thing where you can uh, put on your VR headset and watch a sport from the sidelines, but yeah, it would be entirely possible to put the helicopter data. I'm assuming it'll be public domain and it'll be available shortly afterwards. I guess on a follow up to that, is there, uh, you're talking about the computer processing like requirements. Yes. I'm assuming a, a flight simulator, like NASA flight simulator, uh, Air Force Flight Simulator has that process. Could you do something like this in a full enclosed environment, or is that much more difficult as a gameplay as opposed to a center view? Uh, I mean, VR, I guess, is what I'm asking. Is, like, is that possible to expand to TVs on the outside of the of room? Yeah, this will run much faster out of VR. Oh, okay. uh, VR uh, has to render the entire scene twice, once for each eye. So oh, you're effectively getting half the frame rate from running. So when I'm building for VR, I'm targeting at least 300 frames per second on desktop, which is more than enough to run on four phones. Because I know that once I switch to VR, there's the overhead of tracking, tracking the camera, and that you have to render the whole view twice, which is very expensive. So it drops down to about 140 frames per second in VR. So for VR to not induce nausea, you want a very high frame rate. 144 hertz is great. Some cheaper VR systems run at about 90 hertz. But below that, you'll start to get nausea. If you turn your head quickly, the view might not correlate exactly, and that can trigger nausea after a while. So this would actually run faster out of VR. Thank you. That's awesome. So if that's all the questions, you're, you're welcome to come over to my table and have a go if you haven't yet. And as I said, it's free for anybody who wants to just sign up. Thank you.